All right, good evening, gentlemen. Go ahead and open to 1 Corinthians chapter 5 as we start into a new chapter tonight. Uh, by way of review, as we always do, let's kind of set the table for where we're going to be this evening, set the context, set the stage. Remember Paul, letter to the Corinthians, and we see a lot of issues that he's addressing. Um, certainly the division in the church is the one that he's been addressing uh, right from the get-go, really, from the introduction part, even in uh, chapter 1, you know, of I follow Apollos, I follow Peter, and on and on and on with those kinds of things, and remember how they were lifting up uh, these these pastors and kind of making them, putting them pedestals, <clears throat> and then remember the big problem was they were doing that to a lot of the false teachers and the false prophets who were coming into the church, infiltrating the church while Paul has been gone, uh, remember for a couple years now, by the time he's writing this letter back, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit more. Actually, I think, remember Jonathan and I brought it up, uh, uh, John brought up that like week one, I think, we talked about that Paul had probably written, it, it's apparent that he's written a previous letter uh, that isn't in the scriptures, and we'll talk about that actually a little bit later tonight. Um, so he certainly was there and planted the church, and this is a couple years has passed now. He's addressing some of the, the concerns and thoughts that he's having. He's sending this letter to them. <clears throat> and remember we saw how, uh, you know, he talked about those divisions again and not puffing people up and that you guys shouldn't be so arrogant you've become prideful and arrogant in your own self and in the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God remember this is a very immature very weak very carnal fleshly uh, church for the most part obviously there's going to be peppered in there some mature believers I'm sure as uh, certainly Apollos is one of their pastors um, but for the most part you know they, they are riddled with immaturity and uh, I remember him talking about that you still can't even, I still can't feed you milk. You know, you're still not even ready for it. And you should be further along than you are now. And uh, you shouldn't be regarding us as, as anything. Uh, remember Apollos or Paul, uh, whoever it is, the, the sower and uh, the, the one who waters, they're nothing. They're nothing because God is the only one who is something. He's the one that gives the increase. He's the one that does the work. So you should, uh, you should view him in, in the way that you should view him, which is highly in, in the one doing the work, not us. Uh, however, as we talked about last week, he said, but I am your father in the faith. You know, God used me to be instrumental in bringing you to Christ and, and, and to saving you. And so, you know, he says, you're not even being mindful of even me. You've got a lot of these people trying to be your guides and your spiritual guides and your spiritual tutors and teaching you. Uh, but you need to stay grounded on the foundation that I laid. And remember, that's been part of the problem, that analogy, again, of the, of the builder and the building, the foundation, the cornerstone is Christ. Let's build the proper building, the proper walls and structure on the, on the proper foundation. And they haven't been doing that. They've been building uh, things that shouldn't be on there that aren't fitting and worthy of the foundation. And so um, he's saying, you know, let's knock all this down and get rid of that. Here's how you should view us. You should view us as servants, as he talks about in verse 1 of chapter 4. Uh, you should regard us as servants or of Christ and stewards of these things that we've been um, gifted to, to do by the Lord. And so it's not us who's important, it's the Lord who's important. Remember he says, follow me as I follow Christ. We talked about that and that we are examples for you. And, uh, and that you shouldn't think of us as too highly because the world certainly doesn't. And he talked about we are, you know, we are the dung, remember, and the scum of the world, the dregs, remember, of, of all things. That's how the world looks at us. That's the lifestyle we have. Uh, you know, Paul wasn't flying around in multi-billion dollar jets and had six private jets parked in his park, in his driveway like some of the, you know, the big week pastors we look at today. Uh, you know, he was not that. He was the opposite of that. And so were the other apostles, you know, and a lot of the, the leaders that we see in, in the New Testament. So, you know, he's saying you've got your, uh, you know, you've got your thoughts upside down. You, your frame of mind is wrong because you think as the carnal mind thinks. You think as unbelievers. You're acting like non-believers. You're thinking like non-believers. And I know that I planted the truth in you. And I know that some of you are saved. So there should be a change in you. you we we got to get with the program. you got to start maturing. And he's addressing a lot of those things. And then remember we closed last week. <clears throat> if you look at, uh, look at verse 16. That's where he says, uh, be imitators of me. Okay. Uh, so I urge you then to be imitators of me. And he talks about that later, about follow me as I follow Christ. And then in 17, he says, and I sent to you Timothy. So remember, as he writes this letter, he says, I'm sending Timothy, and he's going to come. And now I want you to look to him to be an example. You want to imitate me, like I just told you. And now I'm sending you Timothy, because Timothy has been imitating me. 
and he's a mature believer, and so you need to learn to imitate him, and you need to look at what he does, and, and you need to learn from him as he is a gifted teacher, as we know that he's, you know, um, an elder and, and uh, a pastor and leader in the church. And so he's sending uh, Timothy there to be a good example to them and to teach them. And then he says, but be mindful, too, that I am coming to you. Right? He says, Lord willing, I'm coming. And he even says it to, to kind of call out the false teachers and the false prophets and the wolves, if you will, that have come in since he's been gone. Uh, you know, and, and the, the big dog's not there to protect the place. You know, the others come in and, and they try to do what they want to do. And he's saying, no, nope, some of you think that I'm not coming because I sent Timothy, but I'm coming. And, uh, and I'm going to deal with you when I get there. And that's what he closed off, remember, in, in verse 21. Uh, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a gentle uh, spirit? So he's saying, look, I'm coming as long as the Lord permits me to come. And so what happens and how it goes down when I get there is up to you. If you guys have the right attitude, like we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. And, uh, and there's going to be a lot of a, a pain and a lot of growth pains for you. Okay, A lot of, a lot of punishment for you. And, uh, and, you know, certainly he's admonishing them. Certainly he is trying to correct them and reproof them. Uh, but we know that you can do that in the right spirit, right? And we certainly understand what Paul and his humility and the, the personality, that the traits and things that we understand of Paul, you understand that he is going to try to do it in the right way, in brotherly love. But there is a point and a purpose and a time that that's not good enough and that ain't going to work. And so you're going to have to just call him out and come right at him. And so perhaps that has to be done with some, and perhaps some are, are more willing, you know, to, to listen to careful construction and have, you know, humbled their heart. So he's kind of warning them, like, humble yourselves, get yourselves ready, like I'm coming. And so uh, however you're ready when you get there, that's how I'm going to react and be when I, when I get there. Okay. Uh, thoughts, comments, questions. That was the four minute, the, uh, excuse me, the four chapter review and about, however long it's been, five minutes. So uh, a lot of info, but a lot of review, a lot of your notes probably that you've got in there. But any, any questions, any <clears throat> thoughts, anything to add to add to that before we move on? Nothing. You guys got this down. You're all good. That's good. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into it here then. Let's <clears throat> go into verse 1, chapter 5. Paul says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among <coughs> pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though uh, absent in the body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present, with the power of the Lord Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, you are to deliver this man to Satan, to the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we love you. We love your word. We're so grateful and thankful for the precious, awesome gift that it is to us. Thank you for how you uh, continue to um, broaden our understanding, how you continue to illumine our minds and, and enlighten us with knowledge and the things of, of your ways. And so help us, God, tonight to... Uh, understand your ways deeper and to understand the things that you have to teach us tonight through your Holy Spirit and we pray all things in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, <clears throat> back to verse 1. <clears throat> so, now we're going to see a little shift here. He's been talking about certainly divisions and things that are going on in the church and now he's going to address a specific situation here, right? A specific problem, a specific sin, uh, really with a specific individual um, that he's calling out here, right? And, and it seems like this individual is going to be uh, known or understood by the church like they know who he's talking about. So that's probably problematic in, its, in itself, right, that everyone knows that. So uh, we're going to be jumping into that a little bit here tonight. <clears throat> so someone, a man, obviously, says, uh, has his father's wife, right there in verse 1. So uh, he says, this is even an immorality that doesn't exist among the Gentiles, or, or the ESV here says, among the pagans. So think about the culture that they're in, this Greco-Roman culture that they're in, in Greece, in Corinth, and, uh, you know, with all the shenanigans and all the, uh, you know, promiscuity and all the sin and all the things that are happening in a, in a pagan culture, uh, philosophy and all the stuff that we've discussed for so many uh, weeks at end and at length, excuse me, that uh, that we understand this is a major, remember, Corinth is a major hub. It's a big 
large place. It's not, you know, this small little island uh, off in the middle of nowhere. This is a big hub of a city. And so they use all these things to attract, uh, you know, it's like tourism for us or something. But they're using these things to attract people. Um, so it's a city, you know, a port city and near other port cities. So there's people coming in and out from all over different areas and walking as well and traveling. Um, so it, there's a lot of people coming in and a lot of people that live there in this area. And so this is what the city <clears throat> is corrupted with. And so certainly this is something that the majority of those people around there would be acceptable of, that it'd be fine to have these kinds of things. And uh, whether it's, you know, um, sexual um, promiscuity as far as other women or harlots or, or whatever it looks like. But for, it's, for this specific instance, he says, for a man has his father's wife. So it's probably not uh, the man's mother, right? Yeah. So, which is why it doesn't say a, for a man has his mother. It says for a man has his father's wife, which would, in, it would imply what? His mother-in-law, right? So his, his stepmom, I should say. So it implies that it would be his stepmom. So perhaps his father has passed away, and he is now, uh, you know, taking his father's wife uh, in marriage. And so uh, that is certainly not to be the case, uh, because in the, in the law, it certainly forbids that. And actually, if you go ahead and flip back to Leviticus, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's go back and, and let God's word tell us what it says. Go back to Leviticus chapter 18. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus way back in the beginning. And think of any... Leviticus think of, 14. Uh, Leviticus 18. Uh, think of any issues or problems. If you can think of anything come to the top of your mind, Just I'm just thinking of some right now, but Old Testament or stories of... Uh, or accounts, I should say. I always don't like to use the word stories because it just thinks. I just think of, oh, listen to that story. Or even when I used to teach kids and you know in Sunday school and things, and it's like, oh, well, let's talk about this story. And it's like, you know what? It's not a story. You know what I mean? It's it's an historical fact, factual account written in the Bible. So you guys, I know, understand what I mean. But um, think of any characters or any people <clears throat> that, that pop out with this kind of situation. Um, you know, marrying their fathers wives and, and just things that shouldn't be happening, but certainly we know do happen. You know, when, when um, the brothers, the brother dies, you take his wife, uh, we just talked about it. Good. Didn't you still have come? Right, which it was, so that was an Old Testament thing where, uh, and then, and then it, the law changed that as well, but the one you're talking about, right, is when the brother would die. Yeah, the the oldest the next of yeah. the, the oldest brothers would take that brother's wife and the thought was God was doing that so that that, that uh, man that died would have an heir so if they didn't have a son the brother was to perform the duty yeah. of the older brother who died and so the child that they had would actually be the heir of the older brother who had died right. uh, to not cut off his lineage was that Lot and his daughters or something? Yeah, that was certainly a bad one. <laughs> Isn't it funny how how we can just think of so many, you know, grotesque and just abominable no. things no. in the Bible no. of people, you know, Lot and the incest, right, incest with his daughters, which was their doing, not his. Yeah, but even but, like you said, even like now, should have been drinking. as crazy as the world is. <laughs> right. Go, right. Okay, that's crossing the line. Yeah. Man, I, I'm just thinking, you know, we've come through a lot of the Old Testament readings, right, in our in our reading through the Eat This Book thing, and it's been several months ago, but man, think about, like, think about David's family. I just think about David's family in general, just how bad it was. And I mean, David, obviously, with, you know, killing Uriah, taking Bathsheba, you know, and just all the things that he did, and then, and then certainly he repented of that, you know, was a godly man and all. Uh, but then look at what his son did. His son looked at his father and saw what happened and took it to the extreme where he had a thousand wives and concubines. Uh, you know, so then, then it was other of David's sons because David had many sons because he had many wives. And then some of his other sons, I think of like Absalom and uh, Adonijah, they tried, they wanted to kill their father to take over the kingdom. And, and then one of them went even, remember, and, and went in public on top of the rooftop in the open, broad daylight in front of the whole entire, uh, you know, uh, Jerusalem and all the people and, and had his father's concubines, if you understand what I mean. 
um, you know, in front of everyone to say, like, I'm the man now, I'm the king now, and this is what I do because I don't care about my dad, and I'm the man, and I'm taking his wife now. Uh, so just so, so much of, you know, just immoral the depravity, right? Depravity of man. And didn't Judah take his son's wife as well? Good, Tamar. Tamar. That's right. That's right. And where she, just like Lot's daughters, kind of instigated that, sure. you know, he was drunk. Tamar did the same thing and instigated and, and did that to Judah. And actually their son, Perez, is in the lineage of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. So that child that came from that was in the lineage of, of Christ. So it just shows, obviously, God is an awesome God, an amazing God. But it also shows us, again, just to remember how unbelievably amazing the story is and how he orchestrates all these things because all the nonsense of, well, men concocted these stories over hundreds of years and they just kept writing and passing it down. No one would ever write the story like this. <laughs> you would never write it like this, man. You, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, let's write this in the story. It would never be written like this. We would write it so that it puffs us up, right? That men look great. And especially the men that wrote about men that they were around or wrote themselves, they would make themselves look great. They wouldn't talk about the time, oh, remember that time that I killed that, that I saw the lady and I wanted her, I killed her husband, and you know what I mean? That, none of that would make it. It would never make the final cut, right? It would never be in here. Well, even a bigger point, too, is that, you know, people say that, you know, the Bible is used to, to gain, like, people control, like, you know, and build, it's like, well, no, even in the Bible it says it's few, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's not, you know, like, most people <coughs> aren't even going to buy yeah. into it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, all that to say, good good rabbit trail, good conversation. I like it. Um, always talking about Old Testament and Bible stuff is great. Um, so if you have more to add to that, we can certainly do that. But just look at verse 8 real quick. It says, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife. It is your father's nakedness. So you shall not uncover the nakedness of your sister. And it keeps going on about that. But there's verse 8 about You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father's wife because it is your father's nakedness. So... Uh, we're talking about incest, right? That's what we're talking about. So that's the sin that he's addressing here with this man. <clears throat> and he's saying that even among the pagans and the heathen, sexually immoral people that you're around, they don't even allow this. And like you said, think about the world we're in today, Sam, right? All the stuff that's like going on that's so ridiculously far-fetched and with the LBGTQ and just keep adding the letters, it's going to be up to eight or nine or ten letters because they're just going to keep going. Think about all the stuff that's tolerant, all the things that's acceptable, all the things that are just horrific and abominable to God. And yet, even all those people would say, like, oh, yeah, you don't do that with your sister. <laughs> you know, you, oh, you don't do that with your mom. Like, even incest to them is is a travesty and, and against, you know, morality. And, and they've got the loosest sense of morality we've ever seen. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, I'd probably argue against that because I... There's a lot of stuff coming out now that they're even going into incest and pedophilia. And oh, I'm sure it will. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all going that direction. Sure, sure. So. And, and like I say, I'm sure there's plenty of groups, and there always have been, like we're talking about here with Paul, and then all the way back to David and on and on and on. It's certainly always going to be even more depraved people. But uh, but in general, you know, I would say that, that it's still, still in general majority of the case, as is he saying, that even they look down upon this, you know. So even they're not acceptable, accepting what you are accepting and your believers, right? You see the problem here? And that's obviously the, the main issue here that he's going to be looking at and addressing, okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. You have become very arrogant, right? Or you have become arrogant, he says in verse 2. So again, this shows the real problem. Uh, here that Paul's trying to expose, okay? Uh, the real problem isn't so much in the one that's doing it. While that's certainly a problem, right? It's certainly sin. He certainly has called it out on, on this guy. But he's going to address now, you know, a, a, big, a bigger issue because uh, the issue is that the church isn't dealing with it, that the church hasn't dealt with this problem. That's exactly right. He's That's probably a big money donor. Bam, there you go. Read, I mean, my, not you read my slides. Yeah. Read my slides. Huh? They're not just tolerating them. <laughs> they're, they're walking around. Like, like, like the previous chapter, and he talked about how arrogant they were. Right. They, they yeah. thought that they had a good grip on the whole situation. Right. And then they're yeah, they're so puffed on, up. Right. And they're almost promoted. Yeah, you guys are good. You're strong. I'm weak. You know everything. I know nothing. Yeah, that whole thing again. You guys are awesome. You got this all down. And, uh, and I got... I, you got no use for me because I certainly can't teach you anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, the arrogance and the pride. Uh, they, they certainly aren't dealing with this. 
uh, which points to exactly what Stephen's talking about. It just points back to what he continues to unpack and he's continuing to talk about. So while it might have been division before propping up these false teachers or allowing these false teachers, right? That's That was part of the big issue, right? That they were allowing that as well. When the false teachers are coming in, it's certainly the job of the mature believers to take care of that problem, right? Especially the pastors. Um, that's, part, that's part of the responsibility and part of what they're supposed to do is to remember not just preach and teach sound doctrine, but to refute those who don't. Uh, so that you're protecting the flock that's part of the problem and so here's he's just going over another issue another issue another issue that all comes back kind of the the heart is that of of all these problems it comes back to their attitude and their pride and their arrogance and their false assurance of all their stuff because they're immature and they just are caught up in their own flesh and their own things steve kind of brought this we were talking on the way home the other night last week and he just got something like you don't really see uh, like wasn't apollos there like there was some right you know, I mean, he sent Timothy in like a ringer or something. Yeah. But wasn't there, you know, are yeah. those, I mean, he yeah. must be getting on them too, right? Like, hey, uh, I, certainly, dude. Yeah, allowed, certainly. I mean, yeah, and certainly I, I would agree that, um, you know, Apollos, we know, was instrumental in the church of Corinth. And he's he's one of the pastors there. Uh, so Maybe he didn't call him out in public? You think that's well, I mean, in it, the letter? I mean, well, let's just think about also about just how, you know, just how depraved people are. You could have three pastors calling you out on something, and it doesn't mean that people are going to listen and they're not going to, you know, do what they want to do and rebel against it. Doesn't mean that the pastor wasn't maybe sticking in there and fighting the good fight, but it it's going to be a bigger fight, you know, because they're fighting back on the other end. So it doesn't mean certainly that Apollos wasn't doing a good job. Is all I'm saying. Uh, certainly he's a man, and so is Paul, and so you know they had struggles and failures too. But yeah, they certainly had strong leadership. Um, and Paul and Paul uh, Paul's talked about that. You know that Paul has is, has been there and is there. Uh, and, and again, I'm sending you Timothy. Um, so and I'm coming. You know what I mean? Like he's sending in, like you said, the reinforcements, and he's still coming too. Like it's a big problem. You know, in, in his view, that's got to be addressed. Well, that's another problem. It's probably where he's hearing. Paulus is probably like, hey, right, doing all kinds of stuff down here. <laughs> Checking in for the weekly report through. Well, the... I mean, somebody <laughs> yeah. who was against it had to be telling. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Exactly. But there was there was incest in the early days in being regular Adams, and that had to be yeah. Even, well, that's right. You know, until yeah. same kind of thing until right God changed like we looked at just now in the law. God changed the the law right. to yeah, to yeah, not yeah, do yeah. that. But yeah, for that's what He was doing to yeah. populate the world is always how it was. That in fact you were supposed to to make it your family members and to perpetuate your uh, family, which we know obviously all of it is one family right we're all really one family one people we come from two people uh and then you know after the flood from eight people thereafter um they're all coming from the same family um so you know it obviously we just got spread out more and more and more but uh but again i think we talked about that in the the one you always go back to the foundations thing with uh ken ham study several years ago we did um before the genesis study that remember at creation things were perfect right so there's no flawed genes there's no issues with any of that stuff mm -hmm. and so scientifically this was some of the stuff ham and a lot of others believe and we're talking about that you know as the time went forward because now you're talking about when was the law written who, who was who was moses. who was given moses. the law moses. moses okay so you've got a long time from uh uh from the beginning from genesis until i know it's only one book in the bible right from genesis to exodus but we know that it was a long time because you've got from, you know, Adam to Abraham is 2,000 years. And Moses was about 500 years or so before that. So you've got like 1,500 years ballpark um, in, in which that changed. Because as the time went down, we certainly know second law of thermodynamics, again, law of sin, depravity of man. All things are going down, right? Uh, things are worse today than they were 1,000 years ago. Like everything's just getting worse uh, even, you know, human sicknesses and genomes and genes and diseases and everything's getting worse, right? So that was happening, certainly, we know. And we know now if, if you have the incestual relationships, there's typically going to be issues with that child, right? Uh, that's been, and that's been the case for a long time now. Um, and so we've seen, you know, that was kind of their, their argument or their, their saying of how God used it all was at that time, those things were more perfect. And so God allowed the distribution, like you said, to populate the earth through families, through incest, and things that we would say is, is incestual now, was permitted and allowable, and actually 
commanded by God before then. And then as things weren't, then that's where everything kind of started to spread out more. And you have all these problems with genes and with multiplication and all that stuff. Because we're getting farther away from what? Creation. We're getting farther and farther away, right? From creation, which means we're getting farther and farther away from perfection. So we, we see that every day. So Even like Abraham and Sarah, that was his half-sister. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. That's crazy. That's right. Yep. And same thing with, you know, when with, with their children. When they went to Isaac, he sent them to uh, Laban, to, to Leah's home, which was Rachel's family. You know what I mean? They wanted the family members. That's why he said, go take a wife from them, from our family, from our kin. Don't take it from these heathen here like your brother did, like your brother's doing. Uh, that's right. So it, it was to be that way. Good. Okay. So, um, again, we see the same problem. The accommodation view, if you want to say that, uh, the Church of Corinth is having, that they are certainly allowing things and being tolerant of things and accommodating things. You know, they're, they're really playing that game that a lot of believers play still. They're just creating their own religion, right? They're just putting things together how they want them to be. They're defining their own God, uh, which is what we do without God stepping in. But, unfortunately, we see believers still do that as well, okay? So, because why? They're immature. That's, the whole, that, that's really, again, the heart of the problem is the immaturity again. They're arrogant and prideful, and sinful more than they should be because why because they're not as spiritually mature as they should be the two should be uh you know correspondent to one another as you mature and grow more in christ shouldn't you become more humble shouldn't you become less sinful shouldn't you become you know uh wiser and and kinder and more compassionate like certainly as you mature in your sanctification process you're becoming more like christ so you will be those things um so that certainly isn't the case in in, in their situation so they've allowed the sexual immorality to be acceptable. You know, like, like Stephen was saying, they're not just tolerating it. Like, it is acceptable uh, because they're not doing anything about it. So they're, they're allowing it to happen. <clears throat> and in that, um, they're forsaking the responsibility, you guys. I mean, they're, they're forsaking the responsibility for correction and discipline in the church, which we are told by Christ to do in the church and that it's important. And so that's the big point, the big aha moment, the application that we can uh, have here tonight <clears throat> is that we see the haughtiness of this church. We see, again, that they are stuck in their own wisdom, they're stuck in their own pride and their own arrogance, um, and that they are not doing the things that they know to do. And I can certainly um, believe that Paul has taught them to do and told them to do, and it is responsible. And like you said, Apollos knows what to do and, and to do these things. So why is it not happening um, is, is the, <clears throat> the question. And Paul is certainly going to make sure that, it, that he does his best to make sure that it does happen. Okay, so uh, this is the, the process, I've already talked about this, that Paul continues to address. Okay, so look at verse 2. <clears throat> he puts a contrast here. He says, not only are you arrogant, and you shouldn't be, but you ought to be mourning. Instead of being arrogant, being prideful, and all caught up in this stuff, you should be mourning over this. You should be mourning over the sin of your brother in the midst of you. You should be mourning for the thing that he's caught up in and that he's not doing anything about trying to get out of it. And you're not helping him in the, in the matter. And, and so that's how we're supposed to see sin. If we see a brother or sister who's stuck in a pet sin or who's stuck, you know, with like this storm, right? Like we talked about it, the spinner wheels, right? That storm is just sitting there right now just kind of spinning its wheels. Well, that tends to happen to us in our Christian walk, yes? I think all of us can pretty much attest to that at some point in our lives that that happens. We need help in that. You know, if, if you're spinning your wheels because you're stuck in sin, you're, you're distant in your relationship from God, you're not in the Word, you're not in prayer, you're getting hung up, and you're justifying your sin, which is what we certainly do a great job of, mm. you need brothers and sisters and accountability to help you through these situations. And you, on the other side, need to be hold me accountable to help me when you see that I'm having a problem and an issue with things because that's what we're told to do. And so that's certainly not happening here. And so he's saying that's what you should be doing. You should be mourning for your brother who's caught in this sin. And your heart should be broken for what he's going through, and you should be helping him in it. And it should crush you as if it's, being, if it's your child who's doing it, or your husband that's doing it, or you who's doing it. Uh, because certainly in our own sin, we should feel convicted. Yes? Ever felt ashamed of yourself when you're sin? Okay, so you should feel that for others in their sin, is, is what he's saying. You should be feeling what they feel. Right? He says uh, in, in another letter, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. 
mourn over the sin with them. Mourn over whatever they're feeling. Feel compassion for them and feel what they're feeling. And that's when we're being more mature as we're connecting with, with brothers and sisters. Okay? So to be humble about it and to mourn about it and to address it. Right? You've got to address it. And look at what he says. For the one uh, who did this deed would be removed from your midst, is what he says. You should mourn about it and you should take care of this and have him be removed from among you. That's excommunication. <clears throat> excommunication. That's like exactly right into, what he's talking It goes right into the specifics of like the church discipline. Like, you know, yep. Like, I mean, they even have it laid out. You know? I don't remember what. Uh, We're this, getting, even, this even looks more serious, though. That's right. We're going to talk about it right now. Because um, that's right, excommunication is exactly what he's talking about in this in this instance, in this case. Because he's saying that he would be removed from your midst, so he's condemning the church. He's coming down on this point, yes, calling the man out for his sin, but now his his real heart of the of the issue here and his, his intent, his direction here is folks at the church. Because of your immaturity, you're allowing this, and you're tolerating it, and you're accepting it, and you're condoning it, and you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because you're supposed to be mature enough to understand that you should be taking care of this. Because there's a reason for that. Think about, uh, you know, what the problem may be is not only, uh, as he's going to continue to unpack it here, it's not dangerous for just him. And you're not doing him any any, any favors by letting him just continue to, to, you know, like a dog returns to his vomit. You're just letting him sit there and do that. It's not good for him. You're not mourning with him. You're not taking care of it. But also, it's not good for you. It's not good for the flock. It's not good for the church to be allowing these things to go on, which obviously the way he's addressing it implies that everyone knows, right? Everyone knows what's happening, and you know of the sin, and you know the sin they're living in, and you're just allowing that to happen. It's, it's devastating to what it, that, the effect can be on the church, on the rest of the people. Well, now that's viewed as acceptable, so my sin is certainly acceptable, and well, if he can do it, I can do it. You see the whole problem? That's the problem, is this church has huge problems just, you know, oozing out of it everywhere. And it's coming all from, you know, the immaturity, the pride, the arrogance, and they're just allowing all this stuff to happen. Okay, so it's, it's a big deal. And like you said, S communicating this person, which he unpacks a little bit more, look in verse 3. He says, though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And if, as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who has done such a thing. Okay, so as if I'm present in spirit, what is, <clears throat> what is that really kind of saying? <clears throat> Excuse me. That Paul's spirit is at the church with them. You know what I mean? Like this, this can be confusing lingo. The Holy Spirit. Um, <clears throat> you know, it can certainly be confusing lingo. <clears throat> yeah, certainly we know the Holy Spirit's there because if there's believers there, the Spirit's there, right? But also... <clears throat> Paul's saying he's aware of the situation. We know that he's been told, like you said, and he's writing this a letter to address these things. But understand, again, remember the difference and remember the authority given to Paul. He's an apostle, right? His spirit, through the Holy Spirit, has been informed and is fully aware of what's going on. And that's why he has authority over the church to, to be an apostle, because remember, he's a representative for Christ. And so he has certainly been given discernment and full understanding of the situation by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, I am there. Like, it's as if I am there because the Holy Spirit is there and he's told me what's going on and he's addressing this through me to you. <laughs> so giving again his authority. Yes, sir. Verse 17, he says, for this reason I have sent Timothy to you. Do you think Timothy was already there? And no. Timothy, no. No, I, I don't, uh, because he's going to be getting there. Um, I don't really know how long. I have. I'll, I want to pause on that and say, uh, let's look into it more. I can't give an intelligent answer at this moment, so because you, I don't know how it? long it took the letter to get there. Um, he did talk about it later with Timothy. Um, at the end and closing letter, he says, when Timothy comes, um, you know, typically he probably sent the letter with someone, you know, because he wrote in the later letter, I'm going to send Timothy. So when he comes, implying the letter is getting there first, right? From from logical deduction. So I don't know what the time span was from the time they got the letter. They, you know, they they had it read to the time Timothy showed up. I, I don't know. Well, but there certainly was a, a time there. But it gets even more complicated because he could have just assumed that by the time right. they got the letter, Timothy, you would have sent him. And he maybe he's on his way or, you know, so a lot of different 
variables, it sounds like. And certainly, though, again, we know that he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God as he's writing the inspired, infallible Word of God, and at the end of the letter, he says when he gets there. So he certainly knows the letter's getting there before Timothy. Like, see what I'm saying? It's kind of a tricky area, though, the Jujun thing, you know, the, 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 the Jujun and not the Jujun and all that stuff, and it's kind of... Yeah. It's, it's different because he's an apostle and everything else, but, but, but it's, it's sort of... I could imagine people in the church being kind of like a little bit like, I, uh, I, I don't really know for sure. Or it, it's tough, you know, to sure. to, to, to just do someone out uh, right. Uh, sure. Which, um, right, which we are going to talk about actually a little bit more next week in the second half of the, yeah. of the chapter um, to address some of that. Because, yeah, there's certainly, again, is is time to judge and a way to judge, which we've talked about, you know, many times. Um, so, yeah, that certainly is a good point. It's accountability. You know, it's, it's when is judgment accountability, when is accountability judgment, you know. Yeah, it's like stepping yep. up, really. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Up. And this is all for the love. This is for, this is because of the church and mm-hmm. the name of Lord Jesus Christ is at stake. This is obviously a very detestable, yes. you know, very detestable. Yep, no, that's exactly right. And if you look, um, excuse me, uh, Pete, if you look at the end, look at uh, verse 12, uh, you know, he says, for what what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Mm-hmm as if to purge the evil person from among you. So again, like I said, actually I won't be here next Monday, uh, but I think Brian is picked up to do next week. If not, John, I'll be talking to you later. <laughs> but uh, By the way. But, um, you know, he's going to do, so he's going to do six through the end there, 13, and, and you're going to talk a lot more about that and get into Matthew 7 and other references that I'm sure he'll tie in there with, with judging and judgment and how to do it. Because that's the point of what Paul's saying here, now back up into our uh, beginning here, is that they should have been judging, right? That they should have been judging what's happening and, and doing what's ha- uh, taking care of what's happening instead of not doing that because of what Adam said. It's an accountability factor. We are told to judge each other, meaning to hold each other accountable. I mean, Matthew 7, Jesus makes it pretty clear. You know, he says, be careful with what meat or what measure you judge others because you'll be judged accordingly. So he says to be mindful and take the the log out of your eye before you help your brother remove the speck from his eye. Meaning take care of yourself, make sure you're in the right heart and have the right motive and the right position to go and to to judge your brother and to help him through the situation. So so certainly we are to judge, as Paul just says there in verse twelve again, that we are to judge the church. Sorry, Sam, I saw did you have a thought there? Yeah, I was just I mean he even takes it it sounds like he's even saying, like, almost like the guy's not saved. You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't need to be in the church, kick him out, give him an opportunity sure. to maybe get saved. Like, maybe when. Well, even Matthew Jesus 18. Jesus says back. that and addresses it and says, you know, at the third step, when you take it to the church and tell the church then, and it says then to treat him like a tax collector. Like, to treat him like an unsaved person because he's acting like an unsaved person. Yeah, if he's right? Un- if he's unrepentant. You know? So. I mean, aren't you supposed to, like, one guy go say, hey, man? If he doesn't listen to you, go get your That's what I mean. Yeah. I'm just saying. Go, brothers, go with you. We yes. go, go with the hand. Right. I'm just getting to the end step. So, yes, right. that's the first. There's two steps before that. But the third step is, and the end finality is, to treat him like a non-believer. Yeah. Because that's what he's acting like. But and it's like three chances. It's like one person and yes. multiple people. And then well, like Stephen said, the, congregation. the point no is to chance. try to no restore, chance. right? The like point is to restore one, and have reconciliation. Out, the devil. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, we're going to a couple steps for this, for this for this particular. Act. We're going to get into it here in a couple more slides. Um, so look at look back at three again. So do you think they've done that or no? Because it's almost like I don't think they've done it. The no. church is like because he's saying like you guys haven't come to this guy, right? And said anything. To him. That's my point. Yeah. So he's saying you know the accountability, and and the problem is with a lot of them, they probably don't know the accountability because they're so immature. They don't know the process and what they're supposed to be doing, and so that certainly no. I would say that has not happened at this point. No, that's why he's addressing this. That's why there's all these problems in the church, because they haven't excommunicated this guy. They're just keeping him in there and tolerating it. <coughs> See what I'm saying? So, no, I don't think any of that's happened. He's a big tithe, that's why. <laughs> like exactly. Adam said, I, don't I guess he was a big giver. It wasn't even, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even uh, the process, really. All those steps mm-hmm. weren't even necessary. Not for this, like not that. For this like, particular show. Yeah. Well, so far out of balance on those. Well, look what it says in 3 again. He says, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. So again, giving, giving that he understands this fully, 
Um, and, and he's telling them that, you know, that I'm in spirit and all those things so that they understand he's fully aware of the situation and that he's not just, you know, making a quick judgment, that he's fully aware and discerning of what is going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you look back at, uh, look back at verse 5, look at back at chapter 4, look back at verse 5 of chapter 4. He says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before time before the Lord comes who will bring to light the things that now are hidden in the darkness and will disclose for the purpose of the heart then each one will receive his accommodation from God remember he talked about this briefly in the beginning there of chapter 4 and not to judge before time and so he's saying to them it is time for me to judge and I am judging accordingly right now uh, don't think I'm being hasty in this thing and just you know being emotional about it I understand what's going on and this was this is what you should have done and this is what needs to be happening Okay, so he's certainly aware of, of the <clears throat> situation and he wants it to be taken care of. So let's look at how he prescribes to do this because this is kind of where our discussion just was uh, before and we'll get back into it now. He says how to do this in the next couple verses. To deliver such a one to Satan, he says. Seems pretty harsh, right? And for the destruction of the flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Flip over to Romans. Over to the left. One book, Romans chapter 8, one of my absolute favorite chapters in the Bible. Good stuff. Chapter 8, Romans. It says, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Romans eight thirteen it says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Right? We are to be led by the Spirit, not by the flesh. And that's, how does that happen? By God's continual work in us, right? The sanctification process we talk about. Because he is conforming us into the image of his son, okay? Which, uh, again, is, is Romans chapter 8 as well. So that's the point, is you are to put to death the deeds of the body or the deeds of the flesh, okay? So that's what he says right here. So deliver him over to Satan for destruction of the flesh, Okay, so to kill the flesh. And he says, do it in the name of our Lord Jesus. So certainly he's saying, here's the authority. The authority is in the name of Christ that you turn this person over. And he says to do it, look at verse 4, when you are assembled. See that? Flip over to 1 Timothy, chapter 5. Keep going to the right, you got the five T's. First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus. <clears throat> First Timothy, chapter 5. Who's the writer of 1 Timothy? Paul. Right. Yes? No. That was question-like. That was question -like. Is, is Paul the writer of Timothy? Yes. He is. Right. First and 2 Timothy. And Paul just said, I'm sending Timothy. Right? Well, here's a letter to Timothy. So let's look at 1 Timothy 5, verse 20. It says, As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. Catch that? What? Exactly. That's what he's saying. Same thing he's saying here. That he's saying, call them out. Look what he says. When you are assembled. Does that sound like a like a one-on-one -on -one thing in this instance? No. It sounds like when everybody's together, and in this instance, it sure sounds like everyone already knows. <laughs> so you better bring this into the house to everyone to tell everyone this is wrong. Because again, it's not just about this one man and this one sin, right? It's about protecting the flock, and it's about what is coming in and what is happening in this whole process. So he says to turn him over to Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. So certainly that is the name, you know, which is given as he is the head of the church and the authority of all things, okay? All things being under his authority. He's saying that's what you're going to do, and you're going to turn him over to Satan for destruction of the flesh. And look at the last part of that verse so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So, call them out in the assembly, make it known, because everyone needs to be in fear of this. They need to understand, well, perhaps because of what's been going on with him, he's started doing something like that, and so has she. And there's all these little things breaking off, and everyone could be doing what they think they're doing. And look, go back to the time of Judges. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. Boy, that's really going to work, right? That's really the way to go. Um, so, yeah, let's all just, and, and it isn't exactly the world that we live in. I mean, that's the majority of the religions in the world, and unfortunately a lot of the Christian church in, in America as well. But it's certainly the secular view is 
everyone do what's right in their own eyes. You guys understand that we're in the exact same time as, as God was warning and talking about and the judges? Same thing. Everyone does what's right in their own You can do whatever you want to as long as it makes you happy, as long as what? That it just doesn't infringe on other people's happiness and you don't step on their toes. So we can tolerate everyone else doing what they want to do as long as it doesn't bother my freedom to do what I want to do, right? That is the society, guys. That's the secular world we live in, okay? Um, and it's just going more and more and more that way. I see half the people nodding their heads. I mean, you guys know. If you do know, you're nodding because that's the world we live in. That's where we're at, okay? So, um, and the only group that is actually not tolerated are Christians. And I mean true Christians, I mean, right? Not the Christian church that I'm talking about that acts just like the world. I'm talking about believers, uh, because we are salt like in their wound right now, right? We are light like a big spotlight in their face to them because they're intolerant of us because, you know, we, we hate everything because we hate gays and we hate lesbians and we're so judgmental and we're, we're terrible because we're so uppity and we're so, uh, you know, caught up and, and we're so perfect that everyone else is doing wrong that literally you're allowed, everyone must be tolerated except for us, right? And that's where it's all going. <laughs> it's just going more and more and more that way. Um, so, so we certainly can understand and can relate to this. And so you can see this kind of stuff spreads like wildfire, right? This stuff's going to spread like wildfire in the church at Corinth. And it's not like we're just talking about, say, an assembly of 10 or 12 guys like this in a small church. This is a huge, you know, metropolis that we've already been talking about. This is a huge city, big place in Greece. Athens isn't far away, right? There's a lot of the church going on. And again, it's not like there's one church where they all go. It's multiple churches and homes and in places all over the place. This stuff will just spread like wildfire that, oh, this is acceptable and this is tolerant, tolerable because this is how the, 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 the age is and this is the society around us and we're allowed to do that and we'll just call ourselves Christians. And we certainly saw that, if you recall, in uh, all through our church history study. Just think about all the things that infiltrated into the church and how, it, in the, especially in the dark ages, everything this just changed. Um, you know, it certainly can happen quickly is my point. And so... Paul's saying, look, you got to address these things. you got to take care of this. And it's not just for the sake of him, but it's for the sake of everybody else. Mm -hmm. But what is the sake? <clears throat> because what is the sake of that one, of that man? Certainly to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Listen, destruction of the flesh, just like when we went to those other scriptures. I die daily, Paul says, right? Mortify the flesh, kill the flesh, kill the deeds of the flesh. <clears throat> Every day, all the time, that's constantly what we've got to be doing because it's a constant struggle. So he's saying, turn him over, that that may be the result. Because ultimately, always, what is the, the prayerful outcome? Is reconciliation, restoration, repentance. <laughs> we, we want this brother to be repenting of his wrongdoing, right? And mourning over his own sin, and you guys should be doing that too. And we pray that God grants him the ability to repent and turn from his sin and be reconciled and restored back to faith and restored back to the church. Understand that in Matthew 18 process, same process. The first step is, like you said, go to him one-on-one. -on -one. And if you talk to your brother and you listen, what's he say? You've restored your brother. Amen. Great. Awesome. You know, he repents. He's sorrowful. I mourn about it. I repent. You've, you've uh, you know, you've brought this to my light and you're right and I'm sorry and I have the right repentance I have the right heart and maybe that takes a, a bit of time before there's you know allowable re re reconciliation but whatever that may look like the point is to restore them back to you've won your brother back right that that's always the goal of what we have in mind we understand though that's not always going to be the end goal right not everybody that's why he goes to step two and then step three and then he says when that doesn't happen and this is Jesus now teaching and speaking in Matthew 18, right? And he says, when that doesn't happen, then you turn him over. Which is what Paul's saying here. Turn that man over to Satan. Turn him over to the flesh. Turn him over to Satan. Turn him over to the world. Turn him over to what's happening. And do it by shining the truth, the light of truth in his face. Give him the truth. Tell him what he knows. Tell him you're wrong in your sin and you need to repent. And then be done with him. He talks about that, I think, in uh, the end of 2 Thessalonians as well. And says, whoever doesn't listen to the words and heed the words of this book, then treat them like an outcast. Put them outside. And he says, uh, I'm going to flip to it actually real quick, just so I don't mess it up. You can go there if you want to. I know it's the end of Second Thessalonians. This is a rabbit trail. You wonder, you wonder if this person had already well, then, been. Hold the thought yet. one second. I already got it. He says, if anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. 
that's the key. Warn him as a brother. Do it in the right meaning, in the right uh, way, with the right motives, wanting to restore that. But do that, and I'll send him on his way so he can be ashamed and deal with it. And prayerfully, he deals with it, and he gets restored. You wonder, and, and this would be a com complete assumption here, following the guidelines of Matthew 18, I wonder if, if they'd already been through this with this person. But That's what Stephen was saying. Oh, was he, oh forgive me. I was, and, and the church did okay. not... They were, they were allowing him to stay in the church, not in the church wasn't expelling him. Right. Because like, cause like, cause if he's going to that, that point of saying, it's time to just say, tell this guy, just yeah. do it. Right. He's been I addressed. Mean, they, did they already do that or yeah. not? Yeah, and and hey, good. knowing, like we said, Apollos, perhaps, and I do, we just can't answer intelligently to that, yeah, yeah, but perhaps true. Apollos has, and you would assume, I mean, we would assume that knowing the little that we do know about Apollos, that he would be. Yeah. If he's knowledgeable about it, you would think that he has confronted the person. Um, so, yeah, th those are valid points, certainly. So, I just, who knows where that process is, but Paul certainly seems to feel like the information is out there so much that those other steps, like you guys say, should have already happened. Yeah. And so, even if they have or haven't, he's saying, we're just being done with this. you got to be done with this. Where are we in the timeline as far as Paul is? Like, because there's that one story where you know, his heart was right, he wanted, he was gun ho to do yeah, all yeah. for God, but then he, you know, he kind of had it a little wrong. Right, and then Aquila and Priscilla is corrected past, him. Is this like yeah, so that's an so Acts. He should be way more mature. Yeah, that's an yeah. Acts when we found out about that, um, which was on the um, first journey. They were in Corinth. I'm just thinking out loud. So Paul was in Corinth 18 months. He met Aquila and Priscilla. They went over to Ephesus. Then he left, and that's where Aquila and Priscilla meet um, Apollos. And, and the story that you're talking about. So now, fast forward, we're on the m next mission trip a couple years later, and we know that he's already gone to Greece yeah. and, and preaching and teaching and certainly has a relationship already established now with Paul and with Aquila and Priscilla and Luke, perhaps, and other mature believers. That, like you say, he's a couple years of maturity down the road, and he's a pastor. So he's well, certainly he farther than be, where you're thinking. And it still could be where he just maybe... A little overwhelmed, maybe a little overwhelmed. Yeah, we don't know, Call right? In, like, yeah. Paul, I'm trying, but man, that's... Not yeah, we don't know the details, but we do know that we understand he's sending Timothy. Yeah. I mean, like I said, we understand he's sending reinforcements intentionally and purposefully, and who knows that Luke and, and others haven't already been there or aren't there currently. You know what I mean? So we, we just, you know, we only get the light of revelation that the Lord gives us in it. Well, I hear that's the fact that he mentioned, like, some Paul, Paul is some Paul... You know, somebody else. Uh, Peter. It's, it's kind of, it sounds like maybe right. they're not all, like, have his back. Maybe they're not giving him the respect right. that, you know, he deserves or something. Yeah, he which is certainly, like torn, and right? that's certainly part of the part, problem. It's part of the division. The ones who are following Apollos and saying they are, are with that. But like you said, the other ones are not. And so the ones who are following Apollos were, like, shunning Paul and Peter. The ones who are following Peter are shunning Apollos. You know, like I say, they're just having so much turmoil and division that it's just causing tons of issues. Because that's because people want to do what they want to do. That's right. Mm -hmm. People yeah. people yeah. are people. But Apollos, but Apollos is Jewish. He's, he has that background. Good. They're following the ones that are allowed to get away with it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
So we also know that maybe 50 years or so, however long that was, that Clement was the next in line after Paul uh, passed. We know that Clement wrote letters to Corinthians mm. addressing the same immoralities. Like 40, 50, whatever it was, years after Paul, he's writing the same church about the same issues and the same problems. So we know of at least four or five letters over that span of 50, 60 years addressing this problem in this church. So... Party time. You could, right? Those were, those those were Greeks, man. Man. <laughs> but that's that's significant and, and, and understanding. It, it started so far, so much further. Like we think that's something new. That ain't new. No, that's something. right. No. That was going. That's, that's my point. Is, thing that's right. Country. The urgency and look, understanding that the depravity of man is real. It has been from Adam and Eve until now, and will continue oh, yeah. until Christ comes. And this is just a problem that they had. But understand, we, we see the same kind of issues and problems around the church. And so Paul is talking about addressing it. Hey, guys, just throw it a quick. Thank you, guys. I don't know if anybody.